criticism, uh, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling. Those are four major destructive behaviors in a, in a marriage conflict uh, that Dr. John Gottman, or Gottman uh, has discovered in his re research. And every time I do premarital counseling with a couple, we walk through this book called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. And my favorite chapter in that book is called Do You Know How to Fight a Good Fight? Now, I love that chapter because it doesn't teach couples how to not fight. No conflict in any relationship in your life is unavoidable. There will be disagreements, both small and large. There will be times where couples are annoyed with each other. There will be situations where maybe communication isn't as clear as it could be. It's not how to avoid fighting. It's how to fight in a godly way in the context of a godly marriage. And so chapter six of this book, it walks through criticism, defensiveness, contempt, and stonewalling as four destructive behaviors to avoid in a marriage when a marriage fight is taking place. And it's imperative to learn how to handle yourself in a fight. This morning, I want to show us two destructive behaviors that happen when we attempt to fight sin. Sin, like any conflict in our life, it, it's, it's unavoidable in this world. We're surrounded by things that are in us, um, around us, that, just, that, that don't please nor glorify the Lord. And so it'd be great, like if I could just teach us this morning how to never struggle with, with sin again, but that's not the reality on this side of eternity. Friends, we are faced with a fight against the power of sin every single day. And it's a fight that I would say we must deal with head on. This is in Scripture, Romans 6, verse 12, just to prove the point. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under the law, but under grace. So let me show you two destructive behaviors in this fight through the narrative of 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 11, a narrative describing Israel's battle against the Philistines, a narrative describing Israel's destructive behavior that would lead to the death of over 34,000 men. The deck is stacked against us that high. Like Israel, like if we do not learn how to fight the power of sin, it will lead to death. This is the story of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant, and the battle against the Philistine army. If we'll be in 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 11. If you have a digital Bible, read out of the ESV bulletin. It's all there in your bulletin. Um, but before we read this account, let's pray together. God, I, I come before you and as I've read this week, as I've, I've studied this week, as I've prepared this message, God, how much I need this in my own life. How much I need to hear it. God, how much your people need to hear it. God, a, a real, true, historical account of your people that entered the battlefield in all of the wrong ways. God, teach us uh, how to fight well how to fight the good fight against sin. God, give us grace in our understanding. God give, God, give us grace when we fight and we fail. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. This is 1 Samuel 4. I'll start in verse 1. In the word of Samuel, it came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines, and they encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Ephek. 
The Philistines drew up a line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to camp, the elders of Israel said, Why, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let, let us bring out the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh. It may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. And so the people sent to Shiloh and brought out from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. The two sons of, of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And as soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise and the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they had learned that the ark of the Lord had come to camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, a God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for there is nothing like this that has happened to us before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians, with every sort of plague in the wilderness, take courage. Be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men of fight. And so the Philistines fought. And Israel was defeated. And they fled, every man to his home. And there was a great, very great slaughter for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell. And the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas they died. Question in your notes, a question that I will answer from this text is how do I let the power of sin defeat me? So the question, the points all in the negative this morning, how, like how do we let the power of sin defeat us? And I'll be upfront, there are two problems with that kind of thematic question even before I begin, because when I talk about fighting sin, it often bubbles up two realities for us this morning. For some of us, like we don't even care about fighting our own sin. Oh sure, we, yeah, we love to fight other people's sin. We love to look at other people and see their problems and their issues and their dysfunction and then go on the attack. But to fight our own sin? Oh, that's, that, that one's not even on the radar. And I would say that's a similar problem with Israel. They couldn't, like, they couldn't even begin to see their own issues. They couldn't even begin to repent of their own wickedness, but they all lined up to fight pagan Philistines. The first problem is that we struggled to even fight our own sin. Secondly, when we do go to battle against our sin, we fight in all of the wrong ways. And that is the focus of this message. Let me share two destructive behaviors of fighting our own sin through the narrative of 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 11. And I trust we'll learn some things along the way. So how do I let the power of sin defeat me? In the negative, here's point one. Go to battle with your sin without the Lord. Battle your sin without the Lord. Verse 1 throws us back into this scene from last week where it says the word of Samuel, which is really the word of the Lord through Samuel that came to all Israel. The, the issue is Israel's still in a mess. The issue is the Lord has not yet fulfilled the prophecy given to Eli and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Well, what, what did the Lord promise? We promised that Eli and his entire house would be destroyed. He promised that the priesthood of Eli would be removed forever. He promised that there would be no forgiveness by either sacrifice or by offering. He promised that Eli's two sons would die on the same day. So 1 Samuel 4 kicks off this unfolding of God's wrath on Israel because of Israel's unrepentant evil and sin. Simply, if you and I want to wallow in our own sin... We serve a holy God who is capable of ruining us in our sin. If I could give a sad main point for this message, like, that, one, that one would be it. So we find Israel, and they're, they're going out to battle against the Philistines. And so 
We're first introduced uh, to the Philistines in Genesis 21 through 17, where uh, Abraham, he tricks uh, the, the king at the time of the Philistines, Abimelech, into thinking that, hey, Sarah is his sister and not his wife. But it wasn't until Israel left Egypt and entered into the promised land of Canaan that the Philistines as a nation, as a people, uh, become a primary enemy among God's people. In fact, there were times where Israel was, was wayward and forgot about the Lord and lived in sin. And so God would allow the Philistines and surrounding enemies to destroy Israel. That's the story of 1 Samuel 4. So Israel, thinking they're stronger than they really are. They go out to fight against the Philistines. In verse 2, we see the Philistines, they're setting up this base camp along the banks of the Yaron River at Ephek. And then on the other side, Israel set up, it's about two miles east at Ebenezer. I've got a a map, you probably can't even see it. All right, that's up in the top. This is the, um, I guess, the journey of where the ark will go. We'll cover that later. But you can see at the top, there's Ephek, and then to the right, Two miles east, you have Ebenezer. So the battle begins to spread, and Israel was defeated before the Philistines. About 4,000 men died on the battlefield, a heavy, terrible loss for God's people. Like, how could that happen? They were promised. They're promised the promised land. They were God's chosen people. How did they lose that day? So if you're complex, so were the men of Israel. And when the men came back to camp, discussions were had among the elders. These elders were chosen men. Even in the book of Exodus, you see chosen men of Israel based on their integrity, wisdom, and leadership abilities. But if history proves true, if the contextual evidence proves true, the elders at this time did not live up to that kind of leadership. Oh, yeah, maybe they had a voice, but they didn't have a right heart. And so they ask this question in verse 3. Why has the Lord defeated us before the Philistines? And this is a strange question for several reasons. Like, first, at least the elders realize it wasn't just the Philistines that took them out. It was also the Lord. They didn't just give credit to the enemy. They gave credit to the Lord. Why did the Lord defeat us? But secondly, I mean, it's strange. It's strange because they're only now acknowledging the Lord as the one to blame. We didn't see the elders or the priests bringing anything up about the Lord when they're living in sin. It's only when bad things happen that God gets the blame. I think, isn't that so terribly true for us today? People that, that kind of believe in God, but then live their lives as if God didn't exist. And when bad things happen, they ask, like, why, like, why did God allow that? Why did God let that happen in my life? Let me answer all of that for us today. The power of sin wrecks our lives when we battle our sin without the Lord. The reason Israel got demolished on the battlefield is because they went to battle without the Lord. In fact, they've been living their whole lives without the Lord. Eli's been serving as a priest in the temple without the Lord. Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, have been desecrating the sacrifice without the Lord. The elders have been leading the nation without the Lord. So it makes sense that when it was time to battle the enemy, the soldiers battled the enemy without the Lord. Friends, the the reason why you and I keep losing the, the fight against sin is because we're going to battle without the Lord. And that, that, that's not a game-time decision. No, you, you've been living your week without the Lord. And you've been living each day without the Lord. And so when you're confronted with the ugliness of sin in your life, it just gets the best of you. You give in to anger, rage, lust, greed, envy. You went to battle with your sin without the Lord, 
because you've been spending your week without the Lord, what do you think was going to happen? We sometimes treat God like some divine paramedic that we call on in an emergency rather than the holy God of the universe that we must submit to every single day. We submit our entire life to God in Christ, and then we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's only in the power of the Spirit that we fight sin. It's in Galatians 5, verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're, under, or if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. God did not send Israel into the promised land to fight the Philistines alone. God sent Israel into the promised land and would fight for them. How foolish we are to think that we could ever fight the power of sin on our own. It's only the Lord that does that. It's only the Lord capable of fighting our sin. So we read our Bible and we pray without ceasing and we walk in the Spirit. But Israel decided to go it alone and it cost them around 4,000 men on the battlefield. But don't worry, um, they've got a game plan. How do I let the power of sin defeat me? Here's point two. Act religious, but forget about the covenant. In verse, second half of verse three, we see Israel's plan to defeat the enemy, the elders. They go back to the drawing board and they think, all right, so why were we defeated? Why did the Lord defeat us? All right, so let's, let's bring out the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh, the Ark of the Covenant, filled with a golden jar of manna, filled with Aaron's staff, filled with the tablets of the covenant. It was the Ark of the Covenant, a wooden box covered in a gold, with gold, uh, with a lid called the mercy seat. It was decorated with two cherubim that you read about, the, these angelic beings over top. It's carried by two wooden poles stuck through golden rings so it would not be touched. It was the Ark of the Covenant. Should have stayed in Shiloh. Should have stayed in the inner room of the most holy of holies. But since the elders and the leaders of Israel didn't give a rip about Lord, the Lord or what was sacred, they decided to drag out the Ark of the Covenant onto the battlefield. Uh, maybe, maybe if they could just pretend like they cared. And then use God's sacred gift as a lucky rabbit's foot, then maybe they'll be saved from the power of the enemy. And to be fair, it did kind of work at the beginning. If you look at verse 4, So the people sent to Shiloh and brought out the Ark of the Covenant. And you'll see that the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they're there with the Ark. Two guys that should have said something about that. Two priests that should have had a backbone enough to stand up against the wishes of the people. Two priests that could have done the right thing. But as we've studied the past several weeks, it's just not going to happen. These worthless sons of Eli, passive like their father, stood by and watched the Ark of the Covenant get dragged out of the tabernacle. And again, to be fair, um, it did kind of work. The arrival of the ark, it stirred up the people. First, it stirred up boldness for Israel. Looking at verse 5, it shares that the men saw the ark, and all Israel gave this mighty shout. A, a thundering, earth-shaking, loud shout that could be heard from two miles away. Secondly, it stirred up fear for the Philistines. So in verse 6, they, they heard the shouting at the camp, and when they learned that it was the ark of the covenant, they became afraid. 
The enemy said, like, a, a god has come into the camp. Woe to us. Who can save us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all sorts of plagues. Don't you find it just a little ironic that the Philistines remembered more about what the Lord had done than the Israelites? Don't you find it just a little wild that the Philistines showed more fear of the Lord than the Lord's own people? Certainly, the enemy was misguided on who the Lord was and is, but, but they showed more respect to God in this narrative than even God's own people. It was time to battle. And like a speech in a heroic war movie, the Philistine soldier shouted, Take courage. Be men, O Philistines. Don't become like slaves of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. Boldness, courage, power began to rise among the warriors, and they fought. And in verse 10, we find out that Israel was defeated again. And it wasn't just a normal victory for the Philistines. No, this time, every man in Israel ran home, and there was a great slaughter. 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell, and worst of all, the ark of God was captured. This is in 1 Samuel 2, 34. It's on the screen. And this that shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be a sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. 1 Samuel 4, 11 is the fulfillment of that sign. Over 34,000 soldiers died in Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was captured. The sons of Eli have died. It's the beginning of the end of Eli and his family, the tragic loss of Israel, the power of the enemy being unleashed on God's people. See, the problem with Israel that day was that they, re they really thought they would be saved by some religious relic that the power of the enemy could be defeated with a religious artifact. And to be fair, we, we still do the same today. We think there is power in what is meant to point us to Christ who holds the ultimate power. So the power of God is not in the water that fills up the baptistry. The power of God is not in the cross that you wear around your neck. The power of God is not in this communion table that we think has to be up front. The power of God is not in some Bible translation that you prefer, or in worship music that you enjoy, or a special church program or event that becomes more of a tradition than it is a mission. Not that any of that is necessarily wrong. It's just not the power of God. It should be what points us to the power of God. And I wonder if we just lose fight after fight after fight with our sin because we're wrapped up in acting religious with, reli with like religious artifacts rather than just submitting to God. Like if we can just act like we've got it together, if we can just turn up Christian music, if we can just say enough things about God around those in public, if we can just post faith-based things online. If we do that, then we think we're good to go. But the sharp warning in 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 11, is true today, that I have personally seen both men and women being destroyed in their own sin, and everyone on the outside thinks they're perfect little Christians. Men and women who, who just act religious and then use religious objects to manipulate others for their own desires. Men and women that first lose the fight against sin in private until the fight spills over into the public. Uh, they acted religious. And they put on a good show for everyone, but the problem is they forgot about the covenant. Isn't that just a little crazy to think? That Israel brought out the golden box but forgot what was in the box? Exodus 19, verse 3 while Moses went up to God, the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, it shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. 
for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. And then God gave Moses the Ten Commandments written on two stone tablets, and those two tablets were placed in the Ark of the Covenant. Israel marched that ark out into camp and forgot about Exodus 19.5. They indeed did not obey his voice. They indeed, indeed did not keep his covenant. Sure, they acted religious, but they forgot about the covenant, and sadly, they were destroyed. That is the destructive behavior that allows the power of the enemy to win. In elementary school, um, I went to my parents and I asked them about getting baptized. And so they set up this meeting with me uh, to meet with the pastor at the church and simple meeting uh, in the office, I believe during a week, a normal weekday. And he asked me what the gospel was. He asked me what my favorite Bible verse was. Um, he asked me what baptism is and, and why I wanted to do it. Uh, apparently, I passed that test um, because I was scheduled for the next baptism service at my little country church in Kentucky. And um, I really, I don't remember a whole lot about that day. I do remember the, bap the pastor baptizing me. I do remember that I, I really did love God and I wanted to know more about God. Church was going really well until it wasn't. And as a kid, um, I think we underestimate how much they're really listening. And I just had heard rumors, new things weren't okay. And um, my parents finally told me uh, that our pastor had cheated on his wife with the church secretary. He then divorced his wife married the secretary, and then left our church and his family in shattered pieces. And I would certainly say that that, uh, that church has never been the same since that came to light. And I'm, I'm careful to share that story because um, those are real people and people that I still love deeply. But I watch how that sin ruins so many lives. And I watch how much it caused me to just mistrust uh, church leaders and even Christians. And as terrible as it all was and is, these people, it's not like they woke up one day and decided to quit on God. They didn't, they didn't wake up one day and decide, I'm going to blow up my life. It's slowly living without the Lord. It's slowly acting religious with no regard to the covenant. To be sure, we are no better than Israel in 1 Samuel 4. That I am no better than any man or woman that finds themselves defeated in their sin. The danger of us looking at this story and looking at others the danger is saying to ourselves, like, I would, I would never do that. I would never let sin defeat me like that. What a dangerous, foolish thing to believe. We are all a few bad decisions away from a crisis. We are all capable of forgetting about the Lord and his covenant. And so my plea is to fight. Fight your own sin. Fight your own sin every week, every single day. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Learn how to fight a good fight. Make sure the Lord is with you. Remember the covenant that God has made with you. See, here's the best part of the story. Year after year, the high priest would sacrifice a bull for his own sin, the sin of his family, and then two goats for the sins of Israel. And the blood was sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant. That day was called the Day of Atonement. So you can see the problem of 1 Samuel 4 when the Philistines walk off the battlefield with Israel's method of being forgiven of sin. Mind-boggling. It resulted in shame and chaos and death. But that story is not our story. Because as a preacher, 
I don't sacrifice once a year for the sins of people. No, we've been given a new and a better covenant that was in that golden box. We were given a new covenant in Christ, not a bull, not a goat, but the Lamb of God who makes a promise by his blood. Hebrews 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as high priest, the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not from this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons and the ashes of a heifer sanctify the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15, therefore, Christ, he's the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression, transgressions committed under the first covenant. See, the best news is we fight a fight of a promised victory in Christ. Because of the new covenant, because of the new promise we have been given, we are guaranteed to be victorious if we are in Christ. How? How? Because Christ has fought for us and has already won. So your main point is simply in Christ. To go to the positive this time, in Christ, we have victory over sin and death. We fight sin with Christ. We fight sin remembering what Christ has done. And I'll finish with scripture that was read by Justin, actually, last week in our communion devotional, it's this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of the sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, fight. I added that. Maybe I shouldn't. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing that in the Lord your labor, it's just not in vain. If you want to talk about anything in regards to the message or just something going on in your life or join the local body of this church, um, just want someone to pray with you. We'd love to do that after the service, but Let's pray and then we'll sing a closing song together. Father, we, um, if, if we call ourselves a Christian, if we call ourselves a follower of Christ this morning, I would be certain that all of us have, have struggled with this. We know that you have called